Okay, I think we'd like to start. Um, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our panel on decolonial practices. We have, I'm not quite sure who Kate Jennings is. Kate Jennings, and she will, um, it's actually an interesting pa uh, uh, um, panel because I'm actually closely in touch with each of these things. <laughs> Rwandan uh, attitudes towards the Gachacha court. I've, I've lived in Rwanda. And then um, Pearl Huneno, Love and Healing in Barbara Boswell's Grace, a book I couldn't put down. <laughs> and then Sandra Young, who will speak about intimate archives and the representation of pain, something that I'm also dealing with. We are not going to be reading the abstracts. So They're in your packet, package and um, in terms of time. So each of you, and we'll go according to the program. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, uh, so I'm master's candidate at Rhodes and my project is on um, Rwanda looking at representations of trauma uh, from the genocide perspective. Um, so in Rwanda, the preventable genocide was written in 2000, um, the, what was then called the Organization of African Unity states Justice, in the distinction often used by then South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu, can be restorative or retributive. Which path should Rwanda choose? What would it take for survivors to forgive, even if they would never forget? How many Hutus would have to be convicted? What sentences would suffice? Would they have to admit their guilt, express their contrition, beg for forgiveness? In a documentary by Journeyman Pictures titled Justice Amongst the Grasses and posted to YouTube in 2016, Salafina Mukamusoni shares her answer to this question. Speaking about the intimacy of murder during the genocide, she says, those who became killers were our friends and neighbors. It would be good if they begged us for forgiveness and showed us where the bodies are. Pierre Mukamusoni is referring to the traditional gachacha courts reinstated by the Rwandan government in 2001-2002 as a means of hastening the prosecution of thousands of Hutu prisoners accused of taking part in the genocide. These gachacha courts were in part a reaction to the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was established by the United Nations in November of 1994. The ICTR was responsible for the prosecution of senior players in the genocide. Those like military officer Teonest Bagosora, who was accused of orchestrating the genocide, and Georges Rutaganda, the former vice president of the Interra Hamwe militia. The first person to be convicted by the ICTR was Jean-Paul Akayesu, former mayor of Taba commune in Gitarama prefecture. Most notably, Akiyesu was found guilty of crimes against humanity, including rape. This was the first time in which rape, quote, as a systematic attack on women or as part of a larger plan, unquote, was officially recognized as a crime against humanity in international law. By the time it was dissolved in December 2015, the ICTR had convicted a total of 85 individuals. For all this, however, the ICTR has been heavily criticized, not least for its decision to hold the tribunal's trials in Arusha, Tanzania, rather than in Rwanda. As the AOU report, the, sorry, the yeah, OAU report of 2000 notes, the Rwandan government had expected the ICTR to be held in Rwanda so that the leading genocidaires would be tried in front of the Rwandan people according to Rwandan law. This, the government hoped, would pave the way for survivors and other Tutsi to forgive ordinary people who had participated in the genocide in one way or another. By choosing to hold the trials of those responsible for organizing the genocide in Tanzania, the UN effectively crushed this hope. Tanzania's geographic distance from Rwanda meant that trials were far removed from ordinary Rwandans who found it difficult to feel a sense of justice for themselves or their loved ones. As a 2002 Amnesty International report claims, if justice is not seen to be done, public confidence in the judiciary will not be restored. Although the report itself criticizes the fairness and efficacy of the later Gachacha courts held in Rwanda, 
the sentiment holds true. Justice must be visible to the Rwandan people if any form of reconciliation is to be achieved. And this must come from Rwanda and be founded on Rwandan legal principles. The Gachacha courts provided such an opportunity. The post-genocide Gachacha system is sometimes referred to as the people's justice because of its, em its emphasis on community justice and community involvement. It is difficult to define Gachacha. Historically, it was a meeting that was convened whenever necessary. It involved the members of one family, several families, or all the inhabitants of a hill and sought to restore social order through group discussions, which would hopefully end in an agreement acceptable to all parties. Naturally, the gachacha structure had to be adjusted to fit the prosecution of genocide related crimes, but its main purpose remained the same, to restore harmony and the social order as a means of reintegrating perpetrators into their communities. Gachacha as it stands in relation to the genocide can be defined as a form of legal pluralism. That is, the process involves two separate judicial structures that work simultaneously and alongside each other. The first is the less formal structure of gachacha, which is focused on traditional values and the policing of individual and community actions. The second is the more formal state structure, which is based on more internationally recognized forms of law, such as the right to legal representation and a neutral, a neutral third party in charge of handing down judgment. In reshaping Gachacha Courts' bodies capable of trying accused genocides, the Rwandan government defined, uh, divided genocide crimes into three categories. The first deals with planners of the genocide and those who held positions of authority, which would then be tried by the ICTR or by the Rwandan state. The second category is crimes including murder and bodily harm, and the third is property crimes. Under the Gachacha law of 2001, Gachacha courts were responsible for, for prosecuting crimes from categories two and three. While still based on the principles of traditional Gachacha, these post-genocide courts had the authority to Im impose prison sentences. These sentences could be decreased or commun commuted to community service if the accused gave full confessions of their crimes. Unlike the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the Gachacha law did not provide the, opportuni the opportunity for amnesty. According to Francesca Lessa and Lee Payne, the RPF-led government rejected such a model because it wouldn't, quote, adequately punish genocides, unquote. Even in cases where the accused had been found guilty of property crimes, a relatively minor offense in comparison to category one or two crimes, the guilty party must still provide reparation to the victims. Forgiveness was encouraged, but it would not absolve the perpetrator and punishment was still meted out. Over 9,000 gachacha courts were set up across Rwanda, each with its own panel of nine locally elected judges to head to the proceedings. Those chosen to oversee the gachacha process were given a modicum of legal training before the courts were set in motion. Judges would hear cases at two levels. The first took place at the cell level and dealt with information gathering and the prosecution of category three offenses. The second took place at the sector level and it dealt with category two crimes and handled appeals from both the cell and sector levels. Category one crimes, as I said before, were dealt with by the ICTR and the Rwandan state judiciary Although this was amended in May of 2008, when the government transferred most outstanding Category 1 cases to the Gachacha courts due to the continued backlog in the national system. Aside from its judicial function, Gachacha also created a space for information gathering and the creation of a local genocide narrative, which fed into the country's national curation of genocide remembrance. Much of the international community's concerns about Gachacha come from a legal standpoint. Because of its informal nature and its roots in traditional justice systems, Gachacha does not allow for what Amnesty International refers to as minimum fair trial standards, as laid out by a number of international treaties ratified by the Rwandan government. Amnesty International further points to the extrajudicial nature of the Gachacha tribunals, stating, 
the Gachacha legislation does not incorporate international standards of fair trial. Defendants appearing before the trials are not afforded applicable judicial guarantees so as to ensure that the proceedings are fair, even though some could face maximum sentences of life imprisonment. While these arguments do hold some validity, albeit from a predominantly legal standpoint, um, there is also the, oh, sorry, these arguments do hold validity, albeit from a predominantly legal standpoint. For example, there is always the risk that the gachacha process will be used to settle pre-existing personal scores. There is also the issue of wrongful arrest and detention, either accidentally or for personal gain. An example of the latter is recounted in Dina Rustin Templeton's book, Justice on the Grass, which initially follows the ICTR trials of three Rwandan journalists before looking at justice at the community level. In her account, a school teacher is falsely accused of committing crimes related to the genocide and is imprisoned to await trial at his local Gachacha court. As we discover, the accusations were leveled by a rival looking to claim his job, not because there was any basis for them. But the story is not unique. During the late 1990s and early 2000s, thousands of Rwandans were arbitrarily arrested charged and tried despite the lack of solid proof of their crimes. This naturally led to a large number of people being wrongfully convicted. Such false convictions highlight a further critique of the gachacha system from a legal standpoint. It's reliance on eyewitness testimony. In the documentary Justice Amongst the Grasses, we see a gachacha court in session. A man named Cassian stands trial for murdering members of his community. One man accuses him of killing his brother. A woman accuses him of murdering her family. Others, however, deny his involvement in these deaths. He himself claims he is innocent. A judge calls on witnesses. Uh, sorry. A judge calls on witnesses to, quote, try to remember what happened during those terrifying, chaotic days in 1994, end quote. This is difficult for us to do in everyday life. In the context of the Gachacha courts, in order to remember, we have the added stress of the, the events having occurred in extremely in violent and turbulent times, making it even more likely that memory may be fallible. Furthermore, recounting such events may trigger traumatic reactions for these witnesses. Such a reliance on eyewitness testimony calls into question the degree of fairness or impartiality that can be found in sentencing by the Gachacha courts. It is this, qu this question of neutrality that forms the basis of international criticisms of Gachacha. However, these criticisms ignore the underlying reasons for establishing Rwanda's uh, Gachacha courts, which were to involve the Rwandan people in the search for post-genocide judicial process and to respond to the need for truth and reconciliation at a community level in which victims and perpetrators would need to live together. Philip Clark describes the punitive aspects of the Gachacha, the Gachacha process as one that should promote reconciliation between perpetrators and survivors, but the punishment should not be solely punitive. Instead, it is meant to integrate reconciliation and reintegration which is why sentences handed down by the Gachacha courts could be lessened or communicate or commuted to community service. However, in order to qualify for these reduced sentences, the accused had to confess to their crimes, both before they were accused and then during their hearings. To further facilitate reconciliation, those who accused perpetrators of these crimes were encouraged to forgive them. Interestingly, um, the Gachacha process was generally um, voluntary and it was only called session if necessary. But the new courts made attendance at Gachacha mandatory. Based on this, I find it interesting that attendance at these meetings is compulsory. Those who do not testify to what they saw or who provide false accounts can themselves be prosecuted and sentenced to between one and six months in prison. I ask, how free and open can dialogue be if it is forced rather than voluntary? 
does re-traumatizing those who are not yet ready to voice their stories conducive to reconciliation? In Strategy of Antelopes, John Hatzfeld returns to a random community with whom he, he previously cultivated a relationship. Um, so, so he then speaks to um, a few members of these communities. Um, and I think that's, so it's time. So um, the best question perhaps around the efficacy of Rwanda's Gachacha courts can best be summed up as a quote from one of these interviewees who says, justice finds no place after a genocide because it surpasses human intelligence. Thank you, Paul. Are you going to come here? Okay. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? No? Can everyone hear me? Louder, is this fine? Okay. <clears throat> So I'm just um, going to start. In 2019, I worked with a group of high school students under a youth development project. Every Wednesday, we would gather at the Rhodes Community Engagement Hub and either read or have writing workshops. One of the resources we used was the Funza Library. Funza is a literacy organization for young adults that distributes physical and digital literature and educational material to young South Africans all over the country. There is one particular workshop that I will never forget. That afternoon, the bright and cheerful faces we usually encountered were somber, and half of the learners were close to tears. Rhodes was in the middle of the silent protest, and the learners had been protesting too after an incident where teachers had sexually assaulted a learner. Just a week before, we had asked them to read a play about a young girl who was sexually assaulted in the school bathroom. We had a discussion and they told us about the protest and how they were feeling. This then opened up a conversation about gender, consent and gender-based violence among other topics. As time went on, some of the learners started to share their experiences with domestic abuse. I was surprised by their vulnerability considering we had only known each other for a few weeks and it broke my heart to hear what some of them had been through. Here were eight or so learners in their most important phase of learning and growth, but plagued with all sorts of issues at home. After that discussion, I started to think about the ways that a platform like Funza could facilitate conversations and sow seeds of healing in the hearts of young people who read and engage with the stories in the Funza library. The following year, I came across Grace, a novel by Barbara Boswell. Although it was published by Mojaji Books, Funza adopted the text as part of their platform under the Bridging Divides Project. The Bridging Divides Project seeks to investigate and interrogate those challenges that keep us divided as a society and to bring the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to life through storytelling. Grace, a novel, is under the category Gender Divides, which has stories that unpack what it is to be a woman or man in South Africa today, along with the issue of lingering gender prejudice and high levels of gender-based violence. I began to wonder how many other organizations were studying and reading texts on Funza and the kinds of conversations that they have had. For me, Grace opens up an important conversation about love and healing. Grace's story is set in um, 1997, and yet in 2021, it is still possible to find a young girl like Grace or a young boy like Johnny who have witnessed, experienced, or are experiencing domestic abuse. What does love mean to them? What is healing? What will happen to them when they grow up? How do they heal their generational trauma? Although Grace is not a story that depicts healthy love and healing to its full extent, it is one that in its themes shows the need for healing. Furthermore, it shows what the first steps of healing might look like. For grace, healing means recognizing generational trauma and leaving spaces when they are no longer healthy or safe. 
In the novel, the meaning of love is defined by what it isn't. Grace's story is one that has the potential to encourage conversation and reflections about domestic violence, love, healing, and recovery. In light of the discussion I had two years ago with the high school learners, I will answer three questions with reference to the novel. How can healing be facilitated? What does healing look like for communities and different generations? How do we contend with generational trauma? I will discuss the text together with the Nayara Mate's article about creating a healing justice framework. In this study, she comes up with the healing framework designed to facilitate healing for women of color leaders of organizations that work with gender-based violence survivors. Grace, the novel, follows the life of a young woman from her adolescent years to her life as a wife and a mother. This narrative is one that covers three generations of women with the backdrop of a South Africa under apartheid moving into a democratic country. Grace's trauma is twofold. There is violence endured by the community that she is part of and intimate partner violence that her mother Mary endures at the hands of her husband, Patrick. The start of the book depicts Mary and Grace locked in the family home, waiting for Patrick to leave after Mary has decided that she wants to divorce him and leave him. A few days after that, Mary is murdered by Patrick. Grace leaves soon after the funeral and starts a new life with her aunt. A few years later, we see Grace, who is newly married and has just given birth to baby Cindy. Although Grace has left the place that has caused her so much pain, her heart, her very person, is still very much attached to everything that happened in her childhood. This affects her relationship with herself and with her husband, David. Grace hides her past from David, afraid that her brokenness would be too much to bring into the love and stability that she has in her adult life. As an individual, she is depicted as one who has unresolved trauma. Grace tries by all means to present in her new life, to be present in her new life, her new marriage, and in motherhood, but they are undertones of unhappiness and numbness. Grace observes herself as detached. She struggles to feel happiness. She is present, but not there. And the old survival tricks of her childhood home are nearly impossible to discard. When her childhood friend and sweetheart Johnny resurfaces, years after he is reported dead, Grace leaves her husband to be with him. In a review of the novel, Merle Williams points out that Grace's rebellion against the collapse of her secure middle-class marriage has its roots in the atmosphere of Grace's childhood home, a fetid compound of love souring into hatred, tinctured with fear, disappointment, and longing. Within the first few weeks of Grace and Johnny's affair, Johnny begins to abuse Grace. And yet, Grace somehow feels truly loved and understood. Um, and she says that where her husband was safe and predictable, Johnny inspires the feeling of wanting to lay her life before him. And their relationship is a turbulent, majestic drama. What Grace hasn't realized yet is that she has formed a trauma bond with Johnny. Johnny understands her pain, fears, and anxiety because he has also suffered abuse as a child and was abducted and tortured by police as a teenager. Both Grace and Johnny have been broken in different ways. Grace by the man of the house and Johnny by men heading the state. Grace and Johnny's combined traumas are representative of the collective trauma of their community. While time has passed and it seems their community and the country has moved on, there is still pain. Subsequently, the young people who were traumatized repeat the violence done to them and pass that trauma onto their loved ones and children through abuse. Diana Amate speaks about the ways that bodies tell histories and reveal stories that are not conscious, hidden, forbidden, or even denied by individuals or groups. Every system is headed by leaders who at some point were traumatized children too. Johnny and Grace are individuals, but leaders of their communities and the families they will have in the future and the children they will raise. Marte discusses how historical trauma gets imprinted on a cellular level through DNA. Children learn from what they see. Beyond that, children are the cells, experiences, the matter which exists long before they take their first breath. We all have imprints of those before us, some that we may not even recognize. Grace's unresolved trauma turns her into a version of her mother for a short space of time. 
We never know Mary's thoughts or worldview, but several years later, we see it in Grace as she grapples with Johnny's abuse. Um, the difference is Grace recognizes the trauma in herself and realizes in the end that if her daughter's life is to be any different, the change must start with her. In the last chapter, when she decides to leave Johnny and restart her life, she reflects on the fact that she has tasted the freedom denied to her mother, but unaccustomed to it, constructed a familiar prison of her own. She wishes she could reach back 20 years, take her mother by the hand and pull her through time, but understands that it is too late. To quote from the text, it was too late for Mary, but today Grace was ready to fulfill an unspoken promise to herself. No man would do to Cindy what had been done to her, no matter how much Grace loved him, she loved her daughter more. It was time to bury Mary too, for good, leave her in the past and uncouple her life from her mother's. It was time to forego the dance her parents had started decades ago, the dance whose familiar rhythm always beckoned and seduced. Here, Grace has taken the first step towards healing, but it is one that started years ago with her auntie Joan. After Mary's funeral, Grace is taken in by her auntie Joan who gives her canvas and paints, and she tells Grace to paint whatever she feels. After one particular painting, Auntie Joan says to Grace, never forget what you did today. You created something. Don't ever forget that you have that inside you, the ability to create an entire universe out of nothing. I did it, you just did it, we all have it in us. Through that, Auntie Joan opens up a doorway to Grace's healing. Grace feels that she can breathe again, and the pain of her mother's death is one that she's able to bear. Although it isn't explicitly mentioned in the text, painting is a healing exercise, one that can be turned into a healing practice. The word practice is significant because it connotes consistency, repetition, and altar built. Dianara asserts that what is needed is a healing space, a place where we can build altars to honor our lives and see promise in the revolution for those seeking justice. This painting practice is one that Grace's mother Mary used to engage in, but at some point, life and responsibilities got in the way. Her altar of healing is destroyed before it begins, but with Grace, that door is open for her to heal both her own and her mother's wounds. At the end of the novel, Grace hears a voice inside saying, look at the woman in the mirror. Look, she's all you've got. You've got to hold on to her, fight for her life, be your own mother, save yourself. And so she does. Grace walks away from the abusive relationship and into something new, but it is not complete healing. There's more work that she must do. One premise of Dianara's framework of healing is that healing is not linear. Healing is not a one size fits all and the spectrum of healing should match the spectrum of trauma. When I think of healing in terms of physical wounds, the wound bleeds, our cells rush to the sides to close it up, and new skin begins to form over time. For some, they are left with other scars, keloids, raised scars that might continue to grow and itch and send pain through the site of the wound. How do we heal emotional, psychological, and spiritual wounds without growing keloids and raised, car, um, raised scars at the site, sorry? How do we form new imprints into our DNA and create strands of love and healing? After getting my ears pierced, keloid started to grow behind my ears, and it took two surgeries for them to disappear. At that moment, I did not understand that the healing of the original wound would not be simple. My healing was not linear, nor was it instantaneous. The second time, I would look in the mirror, touch my ear, and speak. I am healed. This keloid will not return. I love and accept my scars. Eventually, they didn't come back. Sometimes I run my fingers behind my ears, and sometimes I forget I ever had the keloids. My mother would always tell me, speak to your pain. Speak to that scar of what you desire. And I didn't believe it until I tried and saw how much it worked. This small anecdote is to give an illustration of the fact that healing is not linear. Holistic healing considers cultural identity, language, and spirituality, among many other factors. For my mother, healing is speech. She uses passages and scriptures from the Bible 
to facilitate healing in her soul. She has found ways to self-heal by repetition, writing it down, speaking it out, and has passed it on to me. Dianara Mate asserts that there are levels of oppression and trauma, and there is a difference between healing that you have to immerse yourself in versus a process of healing you engage in at the moment. There's therapy, workshops, somatic work, and there's also the act of looking deeply into the soul and healing from within. Returning to the roots that reach back into those before us to love and speak healing until it is done. Healing is not about escaping, but removing that peace planted within. Healing is a process for recovery and transformation so survivors can dare to dream, to love, and to use their resiliency and power to lead in pursuit of justice and healing on a communal plane. Healed people produce healed people, and healing never ends. When Grace leaves, she repeats her aunt's words to herself. Don't forget that you have that inside you, the ability to create an entire universe out of nothing. I did it. You just did it. We all have it in us. In my mind, I see a grace who portrays healing and its ever-evolving processes. I see a grace who, instead of engaging in a sisterhood of trauma, creates a sisterhood of healing. I see grace gathering all of the invisible women she sees around her who have become downtrodden by abuse, taking each by the hand and telling them to, love is not what you have seen or experienced for all these years. Love is not a turbulent storm, boisterous and all-consuming. Love is not possessive. You are an object to be held. Not you are an object not to be held. You are not an object, sorry, to be held, restrained, molded, kicked, thrown around. Sometimes to love is to give up, to love is to let go, to love is to pack your bags when you feel unsafe. Love is healing. Love is you. Love is finding you, remembering where you lost yourself and pick, picking that wounded soul up and embracing them with healing. To love is to fight, to love is to speak and to create. You can create something new. You can create those healing spaces. And even in the space we have here today, I see all of the graces, the pearls, the barbers, all of us holding each other's hands and building those altars of healing. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to start. Yes, okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Sandra Young, and I'm from the English department. I'm uh, at UCT. I'm <laughs> fortunate enough to be a colleague of Barbara and Poro, and I'm very glad to be here today. Thank you. I'm going to be talking about um, feminist works of art that testify to the brutality of gender-based violence and the, the way in which they enable a kind of shared mourning within public life. They confound the apparent separation between the individual and the collective, between the personal and the political, and between what is understood to be intimate and what is public. The creative works have the opportunity to invite the viewer to respond with empathy and outrage as ethical political subjects. But in confronting the viewer with bodily vulnerability, these works also run the risk of enacting a repetition of sorts in offering an imaginative encounter with the very brutality that gives rise to the work. Feminist artists attuned to women's experience of gender-based violence have experimented with strategies for bearing witness to women's experience of violence without perpetuating new violence. And there are lessons to be learned from their creative practice about the relationship between representation and violence. 
and about strategies for building self-reflexive perspectives, as well as a call for action in response to the many forms of social violence that pervade daily life. My talk today considers the difficulties of the artist or writer concerned to give some representational shape or an imaginative encounter in the aftermath of violence. I aim to identify some of the lessons we might learn from feminist creative work that addresses gender-based violence. And in doing so, I seek to affirm the capacity of feminist artists to make an intervention in some of the intractable difficulties that linger within the fields of trauma studies and memory studies. In recent years, justice-oriented scholars within the field have called for a practice-based feminist memory studies that are more attuned to the way that feminist creative workers engage the various forms of historical violence in order to mobilize for more just futures. And I'm thinking here of, of creative um, workers in, in a very broad sense, whether it's the work of visual and performance artists, writers and poets, photographers and filmmakers. To begin with, I'd like to consider how feminist theorists have grappled with the paradoxes and the imperatives impacting the work of representation in the aftermath of violence. How do I move this on? Ah, here. Yeah. Okay. In her work on what she calls precarious life, Judith Butler considers the significance that perceiving the pain of others might have for social life while also trying to grapple with the almost impossibility of any real recognition or comprehension of another's experience of pain. But as Butler proposes, it's precisely a work's insistence on the damning inadequacy of representation that allows for an affirmation of what she calls the human. Explaining the work of Emmanuel Levina, Butler writes that for representation to convey the human, then representation must not only fail, but it must show its failure. While Butler accepts that trauma by its very nature resists representation, and that in a sense, that failure to represent fully is inevitable, she nonetheless treats this as a matter of possibility. This is not because what she calls the critical image has the capacity to offer a faithful representation of the traumatic event itself. Rather, it's because the critical image creates the conditions to show the failure of representation, a failure which she argues then makes it possible to approach the human. And to the extent that this failure is visible and this vulnerability to suffering is made conscious, human subjects might be able to glimpse the possibility of a shared humanity, Butler argues. She sketches the tentative communality out of what she calls endurability, that is, as she puts it, vulnerability to loss and the task of mourning that follows. She describes her work as finding a basis for community in these conditions. But it's worth pausing a moment to consider whether the recognition of a shared vulnerability to pain can really function as the basis of a shared humanity across a gulf of difference that becomes hard to recognize in the search for communality. The hypothetical mode risks dehistoricizing specific and located injuries, and it shifts the basis of the imagined collectivity away from questions of justice. There are questions also regarding how this positions survivors and how it positions the one who looks on, alerted to their own hypothetical vulnerability and the vulnerability of the subject. And yet, what about the imperative to bear witness to suffering and to affirm the possibility of a more just future? Activists and artists attuned to the politics of representation can play a crucial role in creating the conditions for a self-reflexive, politically engaged mode of witness. I'd like to invoke just one more theoretical concept here that I believe to be useful in thinking about the politics of representation. Dominic Le Capra, has proposed a productive role for what he calls the empathic unsettlement in the experience of witness. Empathic unsettlement, as he conceives of it, makes possible an affective connection 
without collapsing the difference between witness and survivor and allowing, you know, without allowing the witness to indulge in the self-affirming assumption that they comprehend the experience of the other. Empathic unsettlement creates the conditions for a productive decentering of the witness whose subject position is unsettled, even dislodged by the encounter, and whose feeling response emerges across an acknowledgement of difference. For Lacapra, this connection involves an affective relation, rapport or bond with the other, recognized and respected as other. And so empathic unsettlement resists the kind of appropriative impulse that has accompanied gestures of witness historically, gestures that ultimately affirm the subject position of the compassionate witness. But how might one create the conditions for this kind of respectful affective response and for the kind of productive unsettlement on the part of the witness. So in the work of feminist artists, we find examples of feminist practice-based memory work that goes beyond these abstractions in bearing witness to specific located forms of violence while also activating a call for justice. I'd like to turn now to an extraordinary example of justice-oriented activist performance art to reflect on the work of representation and on the interventions that feminist practice-led memory work might achieve. The focus of what follows is a specific installation by visual artist and the 2019 Standard Bank Young Artist of the Year, Gabriella Goliath. Goliath's work is in conversation with Judith Butler's notion of the critical image, that is, that which is able to show the failure of representation and in that way approach the human. But Goliath's work goes beyond these abstractions, bearing witness to specific located forms of violence and engaging memory to call for justice in the presence, as I will explain in greater detail below. Titled Personal Accounts, the work presents an extraordinary testament to the struggle to bear witness in the aftermath of abuse. Personal Accounts takes the form of a five channel video installation in which the personal testimonies of five women, all the survivors of domestic violence, including rape in some instances, have been stripped of speech, leaving just the spaces in between, the pauses, the breath work, the gathering of self, testament to the sheer physical presence of the survivors, but there are no words for the witness to process cognitively just the open-hearted, arresting presence mediated by the screen of the women's extraordinary faces. Faces which of course are also all too ordinary at the same time, presented in exquisite and disconcerting detail through the mediating work of the camera and the intense close-up that it projects onto the screen. The installation is set up in a dark, large darkened room with five simultaneous large screens against the darkened walls each of them with the moving image of a survivor talking. The images are large and the women's faces, which take up a whole screen, look directly into the camera, creating a disconcerting, disconcertingly intimate encounter. And they're moving images. The women's are clearly talking. Their faces are animated. The audio is active. But as I said, the words themselves have been spliced out of the clips, leaving, leaving us just with the in-between in sounds, the breath, the lips, the, and occasionally also the, the everyday sounds from inside and outside the, the ordinary home where they were filmed. And in removing the verbal elements of the narratives, the, the words themselves, Goliath's work bypasses the default sort of cognitive processes of what passes as understanding. So that as viewers, we need to reach for other less controlled sensory mechanisms to search for the understanding that remains out of reach. I have two more minutes and I have a whole page <laughs> of this extraordinary work. <laughs> what am I going to go? So what we see in here is the sheer bodily effort in narrating abuse, for example, through Mercia's sharp intake of breath, the high pitch of her lips loosening their clasp against each other, the audible crack as Brenda's palate and tongue <coughs> part. We get a hint of the tenor of Charmaine's voice when she begins to laugh in the voiced intake of breath it's a hint but no more this disorientation of not hearing 
is most acute during periods of animated speech when many short clips of sound are spliced together quickly and we are left with the disorienting busyness of the compounded interstices and the unyielding limits of our own unknowing. Um, sorry, the, the limits of our knowing. Paradoxically, it's in the longer periods of silence when there's no spoken voice to be denied us that we encounter the most expressive moments of connection. It's in the gaps, that, that which would otherwise register as silence, yeah. that we find an <coughs> unanticipated eloquence. Though it's an eloquence that requires us to relinquish our default strategies for decoding and recoding semantic units of meaning, words, and slotting them into something that passes for knowledge. As witnesses, we are confronted by the limits of our own capacity to grasp the pain of another. And yet, if we can stay the distance and relinquish this impulse to decode, a different kind of witness becomes possible. Perhaps our confrontation with the discomforting sense of our own incapacity may open up, open us up to the survivor's vulnerability as well as their extraordinary strength and generous presence. So in, in its insistence on the intelligibility, um, on, sorry, on the unintelligibility of trauma, the work is both a disavowal of testimony and an affirmation, even so, of the possibility of bearing witness, however incomplete, without being able to lay claim cognitively to the spoken details of the event. The witness attends to the women themselves, their bodily presence and what it suggests about the struggle of survival in the aftermath of, of abuse. So confronted by our own utter failure to comprehend cognitively and verbally, as witnesses, we have an opportunity nonetheless to be open to the presence of each survivor in turn and to offer her our attention, to notice eyes made large, then turned away to a distant point out of the frame, to discern the unanswered question in a shrug and the incomprehension it signals, to wait out the full length of a pause when she could find no pathway back to speech, to meet the unnerving intensity of a direct look, to be caught in glad surprise at a sudden open mouth smile. Personal accounts invites us to be open to the disarming gift of connection extended to us across a chasm of painful memory and to experience the shame of our own utter lack of comprehension. I have another paragraph. <laughs> Personal account <laughs> presents an extraordinary testament to the struggle to bear witness to the aftermath of abuse. It offers a discomforting experience of the paradox that lies at the heart of the representation of trauma in recognizing simultaneously the inevitable failure of language and the imperative to attempt representation even so. What emerges most powerfully is the humanity and the strength of the women who have chosen to share their stories. This is not because it replicates the narratives, but because it disavows any sense of complete, completion, confronting the audience with our own limits of understanding. The power of the work in here is precisely in this painful disavowal. Um, it also presents compellingly the imperative that women's experience of violence be attended to in this sense, it offers a rich example of feminist practice-led intervention into the field of trauma studies, taking us beyond some of the abstractions that risk occluding and perpetuating the violence that permeates everyday intimate spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks very much for three diverse but very touching, very powerful pieces in search of our shrines. Um, I'm aware of the fact that there are questions on Zoom and I think questions in the room. So thank you very much. Lomusa, do you have anything there for us? Thank you, Konita. Thank you very, very much um, for that very moving panel and following on on a very moving panel earlier. Um, we're all, you know, um, the kind of effective work um, that, that all your papers speak to is, is 
tells us something about the capacity to be moved. And I think my question is for, for Sandy. Um, so Ariella um, Azulay, who I really like, I mean, the civil contract of photography, she speaks to particular modes of photography as, as instantiating emergency claims. But those emergency claims fail if you don't have an ethical spectator. If you don't, you don't have, have an ethical spectator, um, and it's precisely, and, 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 and here I'm thinking with um, Elaine Scari on the incommunicability of pain. Um, and, and it's precisely that particular modes of photography are not bracketed by language, are not, you're not guided in, in the reading um, that allows the emergency claim to fail. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether it is the, the capacity to receive a mode of representation such as Goliath has, has mm -hmm. a lot to do with who the spectator is mm -hmm. because I mean and speaking into Judith Butler's um, claims you know epistemologies of ignorance are founded on the incapacity and unwillingness to um, to to recognize recognize the other so if you could I think my question is is if you could speak to spectatorship and the multiplicity and plurality of, of, of spectatorship. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you this, uh, for the beautiful panel. This um, question is for Pearl. And I uh, wanted to thank you for, um, you know, both sharing this definition of what practice is, but also modeling for us what it means to speak to pain. Um, and you, you did this thing where you were saying like, I am speaking to the graces, like I'm speaking to all of these other people. And so I wanted to know if you could say a little bit more about what it involves to hold an imaginary for you know these these literary figures as part of you know your your community of healing. Yeah, I also have a, a question, um, maybe of for Kate, uh, just to sort of you know your work speaks a lot on the courts, but I was looking at also the. The feminist angle from that, if you if you knew the work of uh, Anne Aguillon, the filmmaker, and her documentary "My Neighbor, My Killer," and looking at how um, you know forgiveness has been mm -hmm. used in ways that compel women to to forgive people who have brutalized them, people who have brutalized their families and communities. And so the ways in which, you know, the Christian concept of forgiveness that, that, uh, that in, in, has been used within, within the ways that these courts have been set up has been used to further violate uh, women in these contexts. Um, um, and so, you know, to sort of think through the, the that feminist angle there, and and I think also I'm interested in the side of the the move from Sandra's work, which which is looking at um, how language, the ways in which Gabrielle's work um, uses the lack of language, so that the the ways in which narrative cannot be used. Uh, in terms of the audience understanding violence and us understanding violence in order to understand these narratives of women so that that is used then as the basis for justice. And then Pearl's work in which I wonder how language is then you, your understanding of how healing comes about through language, the ways your mom taught you to say, I'm going to speak healing, I'm going to write down healing, and I'm going to make healing manifest through language. And these are such different concepts. I'm sort of interested in all three of your, your different ideas around how language and narrativizations 
are all structured there. Conference organizers, we have one minute. Are you giving us five? <laughs> Two? <laughs> Each one to respond. Yeah. Two minutes, minute. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, very thoughtful questions. And I, I would just want to say um, a, a couple of things. The, I think that that concept of um, the ethical spectator is really helpful. Um, I think that, and, and it also sort of responds to what what you were saying, um, Charlene, in that um, I think that we are we are so schooled in modes of consuming visually, um, and I think that that, that what Goliath's work does is interrupt us and catch us in our in our default modes which is so useful so i, I think of it less as a um a, a lack of language but rather as part of this um work of interrupting our, our visual consumption or our cognitive consumption um that i think is very productive um and that i mean i, I think that 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 uh Elaine Scarry's work is, is so interesting in thinking that sometimes, you know, that language is, is such an important part of sort of laying hold of uh, one's self and world and subjectivity. I just think that it can be, it can be trotted out too easily as if there's this, um, you know, quite a uh, direct line between that there's a sort of inverse relation between self and world. And I think it's often uh, more complex than that. And I think that the work of artists like um, Goliath, really helpful in, in, in teaching us again as, as uh, from the position of the one bearing witness to get out of our comfort zone and just to be more present without being cognitively in control. I think that's all I'll say for now. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the questions. Um, the first, I'll just answer the first question of what, um, what I imagined when I read Grace. So for me, um, I think it's the second time that Grace is struck by Johnny and she starts to see women around her who have been abused as well. She can see it in their faces in the way that they walk in their eyes. And so she calls it a sisterhood of shame. So I began to think um, as Grace goes through her healing journey, like beyond um, the novel and what's written in the novel, what that would look like and what it would look like if she were to reach out to those women and to speak to them, if they were to share their experiences and go through this journey of healing together. So that's really what I, um, and that's why I was saying um, for me, Grace was like, it's the first steps of healing, right? She's stepping out of the situation that's not healthy for her. And I just imagine her, um, even with her child, I just imagine like, and sometimes when I read books, they just go on in my head. So I just imagine like, <laughs> <laughs> her life um, after the text and after yeah. what we read and what it is that she goes through. And maybe she continues to paint, maybe um, she creates like a healing space, maybe, you know, a lot of things then happen afterwards. So that's really, um, yeah, what I was thinking about. And then the second one about language and healing, I really think repetition, because I was saying healing is not linear. And so it's not an instant thing. Um, healing is something, it's an ever evolving process and it's something that continues and continues and continues. And sometimes there's layers of things you might not even realize are there and you need to find the roots, go to the root. And I find that repeating things to myself is something that really helps because it just reinforces in my subconscious that um, I'm working towards healing. I'm working towards seeing myself as whole, seeing myself as beautiful, seeing myself as I want to be. And I'm saying, you know, I may not be healed now, but I will be. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sorry, my memory is super bad. So I'm going to um, answer what I do remember. And then if there's anything I didn't, if you could just repeat. Um, so firstly, yeah, the, the film you mentioned, I think I have heard of. Um, 
we just kind of had to limit the number of texts that I'm doing in my thesis. Um, but in terms of women being made to forgive, so forgiveness wasn't um, an official part of the gachacha process. Um, a lot of that comes from the influence of Christianity. Um, and so in terms of sort of being made to relive your experiences, I think that's, that's very much where I have an issue with the fact that gachacha was made mandatory, just because, um, I mean, thinking about genocide and the crimes that go with it are extremely difficult for us as outsiders to think about. So for someone who has actually experienced this, and I think particularly for women experiencing um, rape, it, it's such a re-traumatizing process. Um, and what a lot, or maybe not a lot, but um, what some women have done is kind of, um, if they were impregnated by the men who raped them, um, there's such a sense of shame that goes with that, that they may not necessarily try and use language um, to express that pain, but instead choose to go through an abortion um, or to give away their child. Um, there's a book <laughs> called um, A Sunday at the Pool in Kigali, um, in which one of also the main female character, she is raped repeatedly by a Hutu man who supposedly is her savior. Um, and instead of speaking about it to the man who is in fact her fiance, she disappears. Um, and when he does find her, she basically, um, she says to him, look, just leave me alone, let me die, uh, because she has HIV. Um, so I think these are sort of more silent ways of um, dealing with the trauma that they have experienced. Um, I think healing didn't necessarily come from that. Um, Thank you very, very much. I know we could actually go on for quite some time, but I don't think that we want to keep people up from having their lunch. But thank you very, very much for my for this very exciting and uh, I think provocative panel and you audience too. And I think that's our time. Thank you for the stars. Yeah. Thank you.